So the first speaker, the first up today, is all things aerospace. So show of hands if you've ever taken a flight in the last 12 months. That's a lot of people, I'm surprised. I thought it was going to be less, so I had to say, like, no judgment, just in case, you know what I mean? Um, but, so if you've ever taken a flight out of Heathrow Airport, this person I'm going to introduce on stage has probably influenced that trip in one way or another. So he works in one of the busiest airports in the UK, and the biggest, for that matter, as well. He studied aerospace engineering and became an aerodrome system specialist whilst he was there at Heathrow. Mo is his name, otherwise known as Mo T. Um, he's a good friend, and outside of that work that he's doing at Heathrow, he's also very passionate about empowering young people to essentially access the aviation industry and making sure any bit of curiosity that they have, that he takes that for as long as he can and brings you to that understanding that you can be in that space should you want to. His videos have been viewed over four million times. I'm talking about like specific videos. He's got videos that have been all together. How many? Quarter of a he, he said quarter of a billion. I don't know. I don't know. But let's give that a round of applause. <laughs> so let us please welcome Mo to the stage to tell us a little bit more about his journey. Right, good morning everyone, or it's not morning, it's afternoon. Good afternoon everyone. Okay, absolute pleasure to be here today. I heard George was introducing the different ends of where people are from. I'm representing Northwest. I was born and raised in Northwest. Northwest, hands up. Yes, my people, that's what I'm talking about. Absolutely. My mum, well, I don't venture to these areas, you know, like east, southeast, I just don't venture here. When I told my mum today I'm going south, she's like, Make sure you hold on to your belongings. <laughs> make sure, you, make sure you, you're careful when you're out there. I was like, what's wrong with South? Anyway, I grew up in northwest London my whole life. I went to a little school, a little public school. And I remember being on the playground one day. And when I was on the playground, I was that kid whose eyes were just glued up at the sky the whole time. I was literally looking up at the sky. And because it's the glide path coming to land at Heathrow Airport, I just look at the planes all day, every day. Right? And I remember once I was sat there. And there was this kid in school, he was a bit of a bully. He called me, he's like, oh, Bo! I'm like, yo. He's like, hey, what football team do you support? I, I didn't care about football. But what do you think I said in that moment? Oh, Man United. Man United. <laughs> I see you're dressed in red, there you go. Man United, why? I didn't want to get excluded. I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to do this right now. I'm not trying to go through that. All of a sudden, I found myself in a position where I joined the team every single play, every single play time. I'm not having to support Man United, the team I actually don't care about. But now I'm sat here in goal, trying to be something that I really wasn't. And that was the start of a journey in my life where I started to be something on the outside that completely did not reflect who I was on the inside. I started to build up this wall of who I was. I started to build up this wall of trying to be cool to other people. But I used to know myself. I used to go back home and I used to binge watch YouTube videos about the International Space Station, about helicopters, about how all this stuff is working. But I would never talk about this stuff in school, right? You, no, no, one, no one thinks it's cool. Everyone's, everyone's out here trying to learn all these players and talk about all this cool stuff. So I would just hide that part of me at home. I'd just sweep it under the carpet and I'd just hide it. But deep down, I knew what I loved. And I loved science, I loved maths, I loved technology, I loved learning about how the world is pieced together. And I used to literally binge watch it, I was like a nerd deep down. I remember I used to sit there, I used to calculate the speed of the International Space Station as it goes around, and I was thinking to myself, jeez, I'm sick. Like I just calculated the speed of the International Space Station traveling around the world. And I thought to myself, you know what? I want to get into aerospace. I want to be an aerospace engineer. First there was a pilot, then my brother-in-law was like, you're basically just the Uber driver for the sky. I was like, say no more, maybe not, don't want to be a pilot. Aerospace engineer, landed it. Went to one of my uncles, and you know the question, what do you want to be when you're older? I was like to him, I want to be an aerospace engineer. And he goes to me, Mohammed, listen, 9-11's like just happened, so... You're Muslim, you're Arab, you're about to grow a beard one day, 
they don't hire Muslims in aviation. Listen, you can be a dentist, a doctor, you can be a pharmacist, you can be all these stable careers. Just aviation, they won't hire you. I was heartbroken. I was absolutely devastated because that was all I really cared about. I didn't really care about anything else. But I decided to stick with it. I decided to stick with it. I remember my brother-in-law got me a little bit of work experience, like a one-day tour of like this aerospace company called Marshall up north near Cambridge. And literally just by me seeing what was in this industry like, and actually experiencing what it was, this one facility, they have the capabilities to design, build, and fly a plane all from one spot. Design offices, manufacturing, runway, bang. They can literally do a whole plane there and then. And the CEO took me around on a day tour and I was blown away. I was like, you know what? I don't care what my uncle says, I'm being an aerospace engineer. Literally, I walked out of that day thinking that. And I stuck with it, went on, studied aerospace engineering at university, done that in Brunel, never left, never left West London, I'm telling you. Literally everything happened in West London. Went to Brunel, done aerospace engineering, um, and then, hands up if you want to do a placement year while you're at uni. If you're going down uni route, hands up if you want to do a placement year. All right? Hands up if you know what a placement year is. Yeah? So that's just one year out where you go and you, you have a taste of the industry. And I think to myself, this is my time, right? This is my time. I applied to all the big companies, rejected. I applied to like a, a smaller company, but it had a big name. And I remember walking into that interview, and it was an aviation, like, it was, an air, it was literally an airline. I'm not going to mention the names just because you'll find out why. Stepped in there, and I remember I was so nervous. I remember I sat down. This is my first ever interview in the aviation industry. And I remember, like, I'd walked into the room, shook the guy's hand. Literally, I was about to sit down, and I hear him go, Mohammed, are you Arab? <laughs> Literally, time stood still. All the PTSD of my uncle telling me you're not going to get a job came flooding right back. I was like, he was right, he was right. And I remember, I remember the HR woman next to him was looking at him like this. Even she couldn't believe it. And I remember I stood there and my heart was shaking and I was like, yeah, yeah, I am Arab. And I speak fluent Arabic. And this guy was not expecting that. He started going, oh, 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 uh, uh, we sometimes work with, uh, with Dubai, and maybe you can, <laughs> may, maybe, maybe you can, you know, you speak Arabic, you know, come see, come see, them ones. I sat down, absolutely smashed the interview, got the job. Yeah? yeah? Thank you. But there was a moment, and I'm, and I'm being really honest with you, like, there was a moment right there and then I was going to pull off a, on a mad one and be like, no, no, I'm not Arab, like, man, I don't, don't worry about that. My name's Mohammed, but, you know, my dad, I was like, no, I'm stick to this. This is who I am. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest here. So I told him I am Arab, and I got the job. And when I was there, like, I, I, I'm an engineer, right? I love problem solving. There was, I was walking around the shop floor. My job was continuous improvement, find things that could be done better. They were literally building a Boeing 737 nose landing gear in a wheelie bin. They would like rest it up on the side of the wheelie bin, connect it up to a crane and then build it. I'm like to my manager, why are you doing that? He goes, well, if you're an engineer, go find us a solution. I literally redesigned a jig that would hold the landing gear from the inside, something they'd never done before, looked at all the materials, how we can use materials to make sure we don't damage anything. Designed that jig. To this day, this facility that does the, the repair and overhaul maintenance of all the landing gears, if you, hands off the floor with Ryanair, Hands up, flown with Ryanair. Listen, I'm not judging. 899 to go to Italy. I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> all of their planes, all of their planes go through that facility. All their 737 nose landing gears have sat on the thing that I built when I was 21. Right? That's the impact you can have as an engineer. Designed that bomb, graduated, finished my aerospace engineering degree. Then applying to graduate schemes, I applied to Heathrow Airport. I'm thinking, you know what? I want to try and do this thing of not leaving West London. Let's see how far I can take it. Applied to Heathrow Airport. Got the job there, and now I'm walking around, and I'm literally getting, getting taken from one place to another, learning about the most interesting engineering I've ever heard, but the stuff that nobody talks about. I'm talking the baggage system, I'm talking the runways, the control tower, not the planes. I love planes, I did aerospace, but this graduate scheme, they didn't look at the planes, they looked at everything else at the airport. I was learning all this stuff, but I felt so guilty. 
I felt so, so guilty that I was learning all this stuff. But I knew that the 16-year-old version of me had only he seen what I'm currently learning would have never questioned whether they wanted to do this or not. They would have been certain, like, this is it. And I remember I was like, why is no one talking about this stuff? Why is no one talking about airports? Like, airports are sick. And literally, I was like, airports are amazing. So I started a little Instagram page yeah. called... <laughs> I started a little Instagram page, and trust me, yeah, it, for a long time, I remember I had 112 followers uploading every single day, opened it one day, went down to 111. <laughs> yeah, I got shagged. <laughs> I started uploading every day, and what I'd do is I'd walk around the airport, anything I'm learning, I'd turn it into a little post or a video, I'd put it online. And I kept doing that. Why? Because I, I was that kid who was binge watching YouTube videos, and I thought to myself, how beautiful would it be if I can take what I'm learning and pass it back to that next kid who's growing up? And I kept doing that, I kept doing that, I kept doing that. Finished the graduate scheme at Heathrow Airport, became the aerodrome system specialist for the whole airfield. So that's literally everything outside of a terminal building. All of those systems that actually guide the plane around, everything from the stuff up in the control tower all the way to the stuff on the ground. Literally the stuff that, without it, Heathrow Airport might as well be Westfield. Like, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a massive building with shops, unless you have a runway, right? I'm looking after the runway. It's the beating heart of the airport. And here I was at 25 years old, being the subject matter expert for all this stuff. And I'm thinking, damn, like, this is hard. But you do it. That whole time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but while all of this engineering career was happening, something was brewing in the background. Because I didn't stop making content. I kept making videos about how Heathrow Airport works and how it's all pieced together. And over time, my social media channels actually overtook Heathrow Airport's official pages. <laughs> and then I'm sat there, I'm thinking, uh-oh, like, if I put something online about Heathrow Airport, I can have more of a splash than the actual Heathrow official page. The COO caught a drift of that, and she actually created a role for me in the social media team and asked me to step in there for a couple of months, and that's what I'm doing right now. So right now, I'm a content producer within the Heathrow Airport social media team to try and tell Heathrow a story. And I'm going to wrap this up with three points. The first one, and it goes back to the start of the story. The first one is, unless you figure out what you're curious about, it's very hard to point where your career is. It doesn't have to be specific, but you kind of want to choose an area and say, I kind of want to be there. Okay? Choose an area that you're curious about, and that comes from self-awareness. Events like this, go talk to people, see what's out there. Go on YouTube, go on Instagram, see what people are doing. Get a flavor for everything. I always talk about it like an open buffet. Get a taste of everything. Don't, you wouldn't walk into an open buffet, choose one thing, and just pile up your plate. Why would you want to do that with a career? Go and taste as many different things as possible and figure out what it is that you enjoy. The second thing is, when people tell you no, ignore them. When people tell me you can't do something, ignore them. And actually, before that, don't even ask. Don't ask for permission to do stuff. Just do it. If they have a problem, they'll let you know. But most times, they'll tell you don't do it with no good reason as to why you shouldn't do it. They just love to say no. So the best thing is don't ask, and you'll never get told no. If there is a problem, they'll come and let you know. I'm telling you, I started a whole behind-the-scenes airport social media without telling Heathrow Airport, and now I'm part of their team. I'm telling you, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Okay? And the third thing is, on that journey, once you start to discover the things that you love and discover more of who you are, start to click that into toge in together. And something that George taught me that I, it always sticks with me is don't just take opportunities, make them. And you make opportunities by figuring out what it is that you love doing and then literally putting proposals together and nice presentations and speaking to people in charge and saying, this is what I can do. And when you do that often and over and over and over again, using the power of social media and stuff like that, you become a lighthouse. And what I mean by you become a lighthouse is this. Remember that little kid when he was younger who used to hide the fact that he loved planes and aviation and all that stuff, and he built like a brick wall around him about football? Well, I got to a stage in my life where I took that light, and rather than hiding it behind the brick wall, I started to use those bricks to build my lighthouse. And I stood on top of that brick, pile of bricks, and I turned it into one. And I started telling the world the thing that I love. I started telling the world, yo, I find this interesting, and that interesting, and that interesting. And the thing about a lighthouse is it has to keep flashing. It has to keep telling the world that it's right here. And once it keeps flashing, there'll be boats on the horizon that see it flashing, 
and recognize what it is. And what those boats start to do is they start to orientate themselves and start to use it as a reference point. You see, the thing that you love, if you tell the world about it enough times, you will become that person. And that's the power of what you could do. George and James, they're the motorsport guys. You'll hear all about them. Every single one of our speakers today has owned their piece of land, made a lighthouse, and told the world about what they are. For me, it's airports and aviation. That's what I love doing. But every single one of you will figure out something in you that you just can't stop but tell the world about. Turn it into a lighthouse. Become the lighthouse and spread that message into the world because those boats that were lost at sea, when they find you, they're going to feel at home because the message that you're putting out into the world resonates with them so well. And that will be one boat, two boats, 112, then 111. One. <laughs> and after a while, you look out and there's literally hundreds of thousands of them. Like my platforms now are about half a million people, all interested in aviation and planes and airports. Who would have thought? But unless you turn yourself into a lighthouse, you will just never know. So do that. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. I couldn't stop that story. He was running over time. I was like, bro, this storytelling is too good, you know. I don't know what I'm going to do.